It's a great uh, honor and a great uh, privilege for me to introduce uh, Sir Christopher Mayer. Sir Christopher Mayer, during his career, has held a number of a number of posts. Uh, in uh, the year 1997, he was uh, the British ambassador to Germany. From 1997, latter part of that year, to 2003, uh, the British ambassador to the United States. After holding that position, he became chairman of the Press Complaints Commission from 2003 to 2009. I would say that on any one of those points, we'd welcome at UNC a, a, a distinguished diplomat to lecture. It'd be nice to have the British ambassador to Germany, nice to have the chairman of press complaints, nice to have the British ambassador to the United States, and he's done all three. And he's had a very distinguished diplomatic record spanning 37 years. Uh, Sir Christopher uh, studied at Cambridge, where he read history. Uh, after reading history at Cambridge, he spent a year at the Paul Nitze School of Advanced International Studies in Bologna, Italy. Uh, he joined the diplomatic service in 1966, and after two years in London, he was uh, posted in Moscow from 1968 to 1970, and then, I believe, in Madrid from 1970 to 1973. He became speechwriter to the Foreign Secretary, and in that capacity, he worked until 1978 for three foreign secretaries. And then, returning to London in 1984, he spent four years as the Foreign Office spokesman and press secretary to the then Foreign Secretary, Sir Geoffrey Howe. Uh, later Lord Howe. Uh, in 1988-89, he spent a sabbatical year uh, visiting fellow at Harvard University's Center for International Affairs. He served for two years as government spokesman and press secretary to the prime minister. And uh, uh, during his stint as ambassador to the United States, I believe it was the longest serving, am I right, longest serving ambassador uh, since the Second uh, uh, World War. Uh, we've just been uh, teaching my PWOD 490 class together, and we've been talking about uh, one of his more recent books, uh, Getting Our Way, 500 Years of Adventure and Intrigue, the Inside uh, Story of uh, British Diplomacy. That was turned into an award-winning uh, BBC series. Uh, today is Tuesday. It must be Belgium. I'm trying to recall Sir Christopher's schedule. He's now working on another documentary series called Network of Power, and this stretches from uh, Mumbai uh, to Moscow. These are not mellifluous alliterating, uh, alliterating words, but uh, uh, literally true. He's been filming in Rome and Mumbai, Moscow, uh, New York, where he interviewed Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, and uh, most recently, after, uh, after, just before the Moscow stint in LA, uh, and did important diplomatic work at the Vanity Fair party. Uh, that included interviews with J-Lo and Cameron Diaz. So <laughs> I, I hope that we'll find sufficient information about those uh, diplomatic missions. Without further ado, I give you Sir Christopher Mayer. Thank you very much, Ted. Uh, that was the nearest thing to uh, an obituary that I've heard for a very long time. Uh, the only thing you, you, you missed out is that for Catherine, my wife, and me, it has been such a fantastic pleasure to come here to Chapel Hill under your tutelage, mentorship. Uh, this is the fourth visit that the two of us have, have paid here, and uh, it has really added a fantastic dimension to our lives be able to speak to audiences like, like, like yours, to be in such a great town as uh, Chapel Hill. And I'm deeply indebted to Professor Ted Leinbaugh for all the effort he makes on every one of these visits to ensure that we spend our time not only enjoyably at watering holes like Cafe Driadi and the Lantern Restaurant, but actually doing what we hope is useful things. And uh, as, a spe as speakers, because Catherine, my wife, will be speaking uh, uh, tomorrow evening, I think, at the uh, law school. Um, we hope we give something of value, but my goodness, we get stuff back. <coughs> we get stuff back by a very, very bright uh, student body and faculty who challenge all our preconceived ideas and make the old gray cells turn as long as there are any gray cells there, which is an open question sometimes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to sort of talk to you about Britain and Britain's role in the world. I don't want to be too parochial because there are, th are things, I think, in our foreign policy experience which have quite wide uh, lessons for everybody else. But one of the things I do have to say is that the British diplomatic service has been cursed, cursed, by witty statesmen and diplomats. And <laughs> two days ago, uh, I was giving a talk to, the, to, to a, a group of students, and I reminded them of uh, 
Someone who's regarded as the founder of modern British diplomacy, Sir Henry Wootton, who at the beginning of the 17th century, I like to be relevant as possible when I'm addressing uh, young people, who said at the beginning of the 17th century that an ambassador was an honest man sent to lie abroad for the good of his country. We are still, at the beginning of the 21st century, trying in Britain to get rid of this aphorism which <laughs> colours the, an entire public perception of what diplomats do and what foreign policy is about. So a hideous miasma of duplicity, deviousness and dirty deeds still attend uh, the craft which I pursued for almost uh, 40 years. But there is another witty statesman who, uh, who I have to blame today, and he's an American. And his name is Dean Acheson, who was at one time a very distinguished Secretary of State, and I think the son of, or maybe the grandson of, a clergyman from East Anglia. And those of you who have been to East Anglia know that it's a lost and desolate part of Britain, <laughs> which does tend to produce eccentrics, namely the entire faculty of Cambridge University, <laughs> my alma mater. But Acheson said, I think it was in 1962, when we, the British, were feeling particularly sensitive about our position in the, wo in the world as we were rapidly going through a process of decolonization and discovered that the nuclear weapon that we were developing was completely useless and wouldn't work, uh, made that famous statement that Britain had lost an empire but hadn't yet found a role. And that is another albatross around the neck of British diplomacy. We are still staggering around trying to tell people, oh, yes, we do have a role and we know what it is. And if you read a whole succession of speeches by British foreign secretaries and occasionally by British prime ministers, it always, they nearly always start off by saying, this is Britain's role in the world. And then a whole series of banalities come tumbling out and most reasonably intelligent audiences could say, well, we knew that already. You didn't have to tell us. So when I joined the British Diplomatic Service in, uh, when was it, in 1966, that's how long ago it was, I found the British Foreign Office four years after Dean Acheson's statement thrashing around trying to define Britain's role. It appeared in every speech given and in almost every planning paper. Uh, this was in some contrast to the kind of instruction that a young new entrant diplomat received in 1966. There was no such thing as training courses, my dear chap. You don't need that. Um, you just passed the exam to join the diplomatic service, and you were in. And I was immediately sent to a department called the West and Central African Department. And because I could speak French, was put in charge of French-speaking African countries, most of them newly independent, most of them, of course, uh, uh, with strong allegiance uh, still to, to France. And the first day I was plonked behind a desk, I basically said to my head of department, a terrifying figure, uh, what actually do I do? And he said to me, you only have to remember three things, Mayor. In those days they called you by your surname. He said, remember that the diplomatic service is a service and not a business. And that is actually of direct pertinence uh, to, to today. He said, in your drafting, I would remind you that you must be crisp as a fart. And <laughs> the Foreign Service was full of eccentrics in, the, in those days, and uh, I've got to say the bland homogeneity of, of uh, modern public service is, is, is a loss. And thirdly, he said, as far as the nations of West and Central African Department are concerned, for which you are responsible, he said, don't worry. This is a French preserve. We in Britain have bugger all interests there. <laughs> and I quote his exact words then. Uh, but as my, as my career progressed, I was not aware. I was not aware that we were actually searching for a role. But when I became speechwriter, to which to, to various foreign secretaries, as, as, as Ted referred in his introduction, I got another instruction, which was, before you make the speech, or write the speech, draft the speech, be sure to spell out at the beginning Britain's role in the world. This got incredibly tedious because it killed the speech stone dead before anybody got into the substance. And all the plan and, I, and as a speechwriter, I was put into our policy planning staff 
Uh, and the planners suffered from exactly the same plague. Um, they, they, they were forever defining our role in the world as opposed to our interests in the world, which is a different thing altogether. And after a while, I thought to myself, and it's even clearer now with hindsight, that our role <coughs> defined itself. It didn't need people, politicians, to spell out the obvious. And what do I mean by that? Well, in, the ni in 1966... Uh, for, for example, we were, let me just go through a few things, a global power of the second order. That is to say, after the United States of America, and at the time, the Soviet Union, which we thought was far more powerful than it really was. We were, in other words, a bit like France and Germany, as we are even today. If there is a triumvirate of European powers, it is Britain, France and Germany, even though our relations within the European Union are somewhat different. We were a permanent member of the UN Security Council. We had nuclear weapons in the end because we had to buy them uh, from the United States. And Harold Macmillan did his fantastic deal, fantastic from a negotiating point of view. Some people don't agree with nuclear weapons, with John F. Kennedy um, in Nassau and the Bahamas. We were one of the top ten economies in the world. We had huge soft power through the BBC World Service, through our arts, our culture, uh, and we believed, and this was based on reality, that as a big trading nation, one of the things about being an island off the landmass of Europe is you have what is known in the trade as a blue waters vocation. You're not just looking inwards into the European continent, you're actually looking up across the ocean. So as a result of that, we had global interests which demanded a global presence. That meant embassies and high commissions in almost every country of the world, plus some military presence as well. And we had a bunch of residual colonies. Uh, and those assets put together, by definition, told us what our role in the world was. We had to do certain things because we were a permanent member of the Security Council, because we had these global interests and so on and so forth. Did we have... I mean, if you can have a role, as opposed to interests, uh, people often say you've got to have an ideology as well. Did we, in the UK at that time, have an ideology? Well, we kind of had an ideology. We don't like ideologies in Britain. If you read the, the history of our foreign policy and our diplomacy, you'll see that it's fundamentally pragmatic. It's deeply pragmatic, if pragmatism can be deep, if you see what I mean. Um, but we did have a kind of ideology then, and what it was, again, defined by circumstances, defined by the Cold War, the defining experience of people of my generation. And so we were anti-communist, and that was our ideology. And we wrapped it in the comfort blanket of a very close relationship, an alliance, with the United States of America and the other members of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Otherwise, leave that aside, we, how can I put it, sailed serenely on, wafted by the gentle breezes of a cautious pragmatism aimed at safeguarding the three great things, security, prosperity, and our values. Values. Now, fast forward, or slow forward, if you like, to 2012, and ask yourselves the question, so what's changed? What's changed in those 45 years or so, 46 years? Well, an awful lot hasn't changed. People talk about change all the time. We must, every political campaign in the United Kingdom and the United States have candidates out there demanding change, promising change. And then, of course, they come into office and they realize it's extremely difficult to change anything, and quite often it's not necessary to change anything at all. I long for the day. This is a diversion. It suddenly came into my head. I long <laughs> for the day when at the ceremony of the opening of Parliament in the House of Commons in London, in Westminster, when the Queen of all ceremony opens the parliamentary session and reads a speech which has been given her by the government of the day, and this happens on an annual basis, and one of the main things that is done is to announce a whole series of 
legislative uh, proposals and acts which the, part, the government promises uh, to enact. I long for the day when the Queen says, uh, my government this year does not propose to put forward any legislation whatsoever <laughs> because it's more than enough trying to implement everything else that's been passed over the last decade. So, when you look at the foreign policy of the United Kingdom today and you compare it to my experience back in '66, there's a mass of stuff that hasn't changed particularly where Britain's position in the world is concerned. For example, we are still a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. We still have nuclear weapons and are about to introduce a new generation of uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles and the submarines to fire them. We are still in the top ten of economic powers. There's a huge statistical battle between the United Kingdom and France as to who is ahead. We have to admit at the moment that the Gallic nose is a little bit further ahead than the, than the British chin, but that can change, ladies and gentlemen. That will change, I can tell you. We are still the largest foreign direct investor in the United States of America. This strikes people as amazing when they look at China and Japan and Germany and places like that, but we are still that, and actually the United States is still the largest foreign direct investor in the United Kingdom, which is a less surprising fact. Who is, who is the biggest trader, the largest commercial partner with the <coughs> Eurozone countries of the European Union? Well, none other than the United Kingdom, which is not a member of the Eurozone. So not a lot has changed there, even if the context has somewhat. And then we have still lots of soft power. Uh, maybe we're not talking about the BBC World Service so much, which is a bit, a bit Cold war -y. But you, look, you mentioned the Vanity Fair party, Ted, so since he's mentioned the Vanity Fair party, I feel I'm obliged myself <laughs> to mention the After Oscars Vanity Fair party, which we, Catherine and I, were lucky to attend, fortunate to attend as part of making this program about great cities um, of the world. And I got separated from Catherine for a while, and I couldn't find her. And I found her in a nest of British actors out of Tinker Tailor's Soldier Spy. Gary Oldman, Colin Firth, Justin Cumberledge. Cumberledge? Something like that. And I thought, there is my wife with Britain's soft power. <laughs> and it was. It, but it, was, it, was, it was a reality. And then there was the, you know, the footballer David Beckham and his wife Victoria Beckham. And then Elton John was there. I, I mean, so... The, the, the products change, but the cultural influence is there. And it's not just uh, flash and celebrities, but literature and music uh, and, and all the kinds of things that carry a nation's influence around the globe. And then another thing, it, it, we still deeply believe in having global interests because we do have global interests. We, we need to trade and invest in mutually with almost every country in the world, and because of that, we believe we need assets globally to defend these interests insofar as we can. It's not a question of sending gunboats anywhere, because it's all we can do to afford to pay for a single destroyer, but that's, that's a, another matter. And still, we regard the three pillars, the three pillars of Britain's national interest, broadly defined as security, prosperity, and the promulgation of values. Actually, there is a fourth component which has been added to these three, which was not much around in the, in the 60s and very much reflects the temper of the times. The fourth necessary pillar for our role in the world is to get Brits out of trouble. Now, as international travel has proliferated and people, tourism exists in almost every nation on God's earth, Brits get into more and more trouble. There are more and more places where you can binge drink, get blind drunk and plastered, get put in jail by the local police, and then the parents are on the phone to the foreign office saying, Jimmy's in jail in Alicante, and uh, what are you doing to get him out? Why is he in there? Is he in a well, he assaulted three women, beat up a policeman, and <laughs> broke the ribs of the bartender. It's not fair. He should be back in Britain. And, and uh, you know, we have this, we have this all, all the time. 
And if you go to the British Foreign Office today, this is something that has changed, uh, you will find them obsessed with uh, what, they what they call rapid reaction teams that as soon as Brits get into trouble, whiz out to try and dig them out. It costs a fortune. And the Foreign Office budget is not very big, and it is at the expense of other, other things. But it has become one of our roles in the world is to provide an expensive search and rescue service for mostly stupid and ungrateful British people <laughs> who get into, some of them, of course, are in genuine distress and need to be genuinely helped. And it is actually a serious function of, of diplomacy. But this has kind of got out of, out of control. But an awful lot has changed, which, which also defines our role in the world without our having to make speeches about what our role is. And the things that have changed are very, very interesting. And I haven't completely got my head around this, but one of the things that sprung out of making this program about uh, great cities of the world, we started with a uh, hypothesis which we we're going to test by making this six-part documentary. As you said, Mumbai, Rome, uh, New York, LA, Moscow, and then London itself. That maybe that these six cities, um, although they're not all capital cities, uh, have more in common with each other than they do with their own national hinterlands. And we've been testing this hypothesis everywhere, and it's partly right and it's partly wrong. That's the sort of anecdotal evidence so far. But one of the thoughts that really occurred to me about London, even before we started making the program, is that when you're talking about roles of nations, London has developed in a way in the, over the last 40 years where it has an almost autonomous, independent, international role separate from the UK as a whole. In other words, the metropolis has developed in such a way that it is different in so many different ways uh, from the rest of our country. And it has become, for example, it's something similar for New York, certainly for Mumbai, um, uh, not yet in Moscow, it has become a magnet for international financial services. So it is possibly the most important financial services center in the world apart from New York City. It is a magnet for immigration of all kinds. You travel on the tube, the subway now, and you are surrounded with people speaking every language on God's earth, and they're not just tourists. It, is a, it has become a magnet for wealth, a magnet for tourism, a magnet for culture. I think of it almost as an independent city-state. And it has this role uh, which makes it, it in the concentration of, of wealth and prosperity in London as a percentage of total UK GDP. I don't know the exact figure, but it's extraordinary. It is an extraordinary figure. So we didn't have this in 1966. We have it now, and it, it, it defines a new kind of international role for the nation by virtue of having the city-state sitting not all that far up the Thames estuary. There's something else that has changed very fundamentally, which, which also makes the role very different. Uh, in '66, we were, of course, uh, a member of the what was then called the European Communities, which is now called the European Union. In those days, it didn't impinge that much on our consciousness. Um, actually, I think it was still called the common market then. I can't remember. My chronology blurs whenever I think of the European Union, along with a lot of other things, too. And um, what we have now, though, in a way which does not affect the United States in any similar way, is our sovereignty, for better or for worse, depending on your point of view, is quite substantially curtailed by an increasingly fraught relationship with the European Union. I'm not going to do all the details because um, it, is, it is a fairly dry subject, but not many people know that the European Union as such, as is to say its executive body, the European Commission, negotiates for all the member states, including the United Kingdom, in all external trade uh, negotiations. And... Uh, Although the member states have a role in saying what the uh, mandate should be for the negotiation, once that has been granted to the Commission, off it goes 
and it negotiates. We have c ceded sovereignty in agricultural policy. We have ceded sovereignty in fisheries policy. We have ceded some sovereignty in matters of domestic welfare, social services, and things like that. And bit by bit, the area of policy, which is decided either by majority vote or what is known as qualified majority vote, um, becomes greater and greater, such that we have reached a stage now in the United Kingdom where the questioning of the very membership of the European Union, as opposed to whether we should give up the pound and adopt the euro, heaven forfend in the current circumstances, um, um, is now actually on the table. It is not a fringe, loony uh, concern. It has now become actually a concern of people, mainly in the Conservative Party, but even, even in the Labour Party. Is this membership worthwhile? Is it right that before we can decide on a number of what in the past were always quintessentially domestic issues, is it right that we should cede this decision-making to regulations and directives uh, which have emerged from Brussels? Um, there is another thing, too, which, 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 has, which has changed, which is it's not just a question of ceding sovereignty to the European Union, um, but actually... Uh, decisions handed down by the courts in the United Kingdom, including by our equivalent of your Supreme Court, which we now call a Supreme Court, can in many cases be appealed to the European Court of Human Rights, which is different from the European Court of Justice, which is responsible for directives emerging from the European Union. The European Court of Human Rights is, is quite different. But that also now has now curtailed the sovereignty of our Supreme Court, and of Parliament's traditional sovereignty, which goes back to the, uh, to the uh, 16th and 17th uh, centuries. And this is also an abrasive matter which people are questioning more and more. So then we have to look again, I think, in making these comparisons, about we look at ideology again. We're not a very ideological nation, as I said, probably much less so than you are, and this has something to do with the influence of, I was going to say religion, I don't think I mean that, I think I mean religiosity in politics. I think the way you, Americans, politically, whether you're Republicans or Democrats, uh, allow religiosity into your political speech and rhetoric reminds me very much of Victorian England very much of Victorian England. We've now lost that uh, in, in, in our politics, and so uh, we don't have that as a kind of base element uh, for um, an ideological expression of what it is to be British and what the British role should be in the world. And in fact, we sort of run out of sort of ideological sources with, with the end of communism. When communism went, when the Soviet Union collapsed and broke up into Russia and a number of independent states, um, it led to a whole series of confusions. And one of them was, what is the ideological basis of our foreign policy, the, the cement for the Atlantic Alliance? Where is it? What is it? Um, the war on terror, so-called, uh, partly replaced it. But this led us into all kinds of weird errors because, uh, and also by trying to, some people trying to make radical Islam, a replacement for Soviet-style communism. But this has got us, the British, in our role in the world, in the way we express it, into a terrible tangle. And we're not alone in all this, because if you look at the intervention in Iraq, which at the time, I have to say to you, quite frankly, I'd support it, but if you look at the intervention in Iraq and you ask yourself, who is the strategic beneficiary of that intervention, there can only be one answer, which is Iran. If you look at the intervention in Afghanistan uh, and ask yourself, uh, who is the principal beneficiary of a war that has gone on longer than the two world wars placed end to end, the answer is not NATO, not the United States, and certainly not the United Kingdom. It is a classic case of military means being almost entirely disconnected from realistic political objectives. 
we in Britain have got ourselves into a particular rhetorical bind, especially since the Arab Spring, because we have always espoused, we still do to a certain extent, moderation, moderation in all things. We love moderate this, moderate that. We adore moderate Islam. We believe very strongly in moderate Islam and our concern inside the United Kingdom that radical Islamic movements don't take root is expressed in our support for moderate Islamic <coughs> bodies. So no one's totally defined what moderate and extreme mean here. We also espouse democracy. Who doesn't? I mean, it's just, what's it? Motherhood and apple pie. <laughs> Who could not espouse democracy? Huh. But this is where the bind comes, because suddenly, you know, politicians making these speeches, moderation, democracy, suddenly in the Middle East, we realize a hideous thing that the moderate governments whom we supported were pretty tyrannical and totalitarian. And the democracies that we supported were countries and organizations of which we were extremely wary. For example, Hamas was elected in a pretty clean election in Palestine. Hezbollah, we don't like Hezbollah at all but it has deputies in the Lebanese parliament which, who are there by virtue of elections. And then the Arab Spring comes along and our close friend, the ex-president of Egypt, Mr. Mubarak, uh, with whom we have maintained, as you did, a strategic alliance for a very, very long time, is swept away in the euphoria of the Arab Spring and the Tahrir Square events. And... Uh, Elections are declared in a new constitution and all of that. And suddenly, people are terrified in, back in London, in the Foreign Office and in the State Department. What if Islamic parties f win a fair democratic election? What do we do? Of course, the answer to that is accept it, for God's sake, and don't be stupid. And uh, uh, this has produced uh, all kinds of tensions and contradictions in our attitude to the Arab Spring, which I must say in certain areas is starting to look pretty wintry. Something, something else has happened as well. Something else has happened as well, and I, I won't go on too long about this. Um, that one of the reasons why there has been confusion uh, in Britain about defining the national interest and defining the role is because in the machine of foreign policy is not quite the Rolls-Royce it used to be. It's a bit of a spluttering, um, down-market, second-hand car now. Partly this is because the, the authority and influence over foreign policy of the Foreign Office itself has declined, partly through a series of self-inflicted wounds, like closing down the language school. You know, those whom the gods destroy, they first make mad. Only a lunatic could have taken that decision. Uh, the obsession with multilateral diplomacy over bilateral diplomacy, the shutting down of embassies and posts abroad, and the uh, 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 demoting inside the Foreign Office of the importance of bilateral expertise. Uh, then something else has happened bureaucratically and institutionally in London over the last decade, decade and a half. Uh, the Foreign Office has yielded even more ground to the authority of Number 10 Downing Street and the Prime Minister over the uh, implementation of foreign policy. It's always been traditionally the case that Prime Ministers will do this, but this has now gone much further than historically has ever been the case before. And we saw how when Tony Blair was Prime Minister, he totally appropriated, even more than Margaret Thatcher had done, control over UK relations with the United States. The present Prime Minister, David Cameron, has introduced an American institution into the uh, uh, foreign policy bureaucracy, which he calls the NSC, the National Security <laughs> Council. It's an absolute rip-off of yours, uh, except that... Uh, Compared with yours, it's small and understaffed and under-resourced and doesn't seem to do very much except preside over disastrous reviews of the articulation between defense and, uh, and foreign policy. The department responsible for dispensing international aid has a budget three times the size of that of the Foreign Office. Uh, the Ministry of Defense has an influence over foreign policy may be greater than at any time since the Second World War, precisely because our external actions have been so defined by fighting wars in, in Iraq and in uh, Afghanistan. 
And the Treasury, the Treasury, which has always hated the Foreign Office and competed fiercely for the best candidates out of the civil service exams, has hacked away at the Foreign Office budget and nobody has been around to defend it. Put that all together and you, what you have is not simply a Foreign Office that, that has become diminished, but a lack of coherence, a lack of coherence, lack of clarity about A, the national interest, and what we should be doing in the world. So we have quite ambitious uh, 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 plans for what we do, like intervening very actively in Libya, and then we suddenly end up with no aircraft carriers and no aircraft to put on them. And when the aircraft carriers do arrive, there'll still be no aircraft to put on them. And meantime, we still have the colonial relic of the Falkland Islands down near Argentina, and um, it's almost as if we're saying to the Argentinians, uh, my dear chaps, you have about 10 years in which to <laughs> invade uh, Argentina, but if you leave it too late, we'll have, it. We'll have both aircraft carriers and aircraft, <laughs> and we will whip your ass as we did in 1982. <laughs> um, and there's also a counter-ideology which doesn't help, and the counter-ideology is this. It was much espoused by, by Tony Blair. I'm not making a, a political point at all. He made a series, just before he left office as Prime Minister, he made a series of, uh, of uh, speeches about foreign policy and Britain's role in the world. And his central thesis was that such is the interdependence of things, uh, such is the importance of globalization, which he never fully defined, that it is no longer possible for the nation state to rest on what he called uh, narrow nationalism or narrow national self-interest and the time had come for global values to solve global problems. Well, that is a utopian view of what is possible. The dystopian view is the only realistic view. As I've said several times already in this series of speeches which Ted has invited me to, to make while I've been here, you only have to look at climate change conferences most recently, Copenhagen, Cancun, Durban, to see that the global imperative of doing something about greenhouse gases is not sufficient to overcome a very narrow, very selfish, but very present uh, uh, national interest. And it doesn't look like that is going to change anytime soon. But it is an ideology which has <coughs> undermined, certainly in, in Britain, the power of foreign policy and the power um, of the uh, diplomat. We have a foreign secretary in William Hague who is the first foreign secretary for a long time who knows history, is steeped in history, who understands uh, the nature of things, um, who is as well versed in these matters perhaps as Henry Kissinger. And he had made a speech, uh, I think it was in the autumn of last year, in which he said he was going to roll back all this stuff and bring back a, a coherence into, uh, into British foreign policy. Well, I hope he will. And in so doing, I hope also that he says to his speechwriter, never, ever give me a speech which seeks to define Britain's role in the world. It's obvious, it's self-evident, and it must follow the tradition of sensible pragmatism in dealing with events as they arise. Thank you very much.